In this meditation, I want to suggest a question to each one of us. What's our relationship with time? How do we view our use of time? Or more precisely, putting that question in a one-to-one dialogue with our Lord, Jesus, not just how do I use time, that's not maybe the first question, that's maybe a very practical, concrete question to consider, but how do I view time, especially Jesus in relation to you? Is time for me something that I kind of take for granted? Something that ultimately I think that belongs to me? Is my relationship with time something in which God comes in as an outsider, so to speak, someone who is a bit of a burden, someone who comes in and kind of complicates, complicates my life. We might humorously say, imagine ourselves saying, we are very sincere with God, Jesus, I already have so many things to do. Why do you have to trouble me with <laughs> other things? If you suggest something to me in, in prayer or maybe through the church, you, you ask me or you challenge me, for example, to, to give time to prayer or going to mass or going to church. But I already have so many things to do. I have so many plans. I already have my plans. And the perspective for our meditation is the parable which our Lord tells in chapter 25 of Matthew. It was read in the Mass last Sunday, and many of you have already, well, thought about it. But I think even in that case, it's useful for us to come back to it once more. For many of us, for many of us it is a very familiar parable. But it's one of those great parables of our Lord. There are many different ways of praying about it. So it goes, Jesus says, For it will be as when a man going on a journey called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you have made, you have delivered me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not winnow. So I was afraid 
and I went and hid your talent in the crowd. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I have not winnowed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have abundance. From, from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Apparently it's quite a harsh parable, and it's interesting for us in our prayer to read it um, in such a way that we somehow kind of imagine ourselves in, in the story. Many times we notice different things depending on how we relate to the, uh, the events that Jesus tells or the events that the gospel writers tell us. Here, for example, we can maybe relate to imagine ourselves as one of the first two, and we can rejoice in hearing that response of God. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Jesus, how I would like to hear those words from your lips when it is time for me to enter into your presence. <laughs> how I look forward to those words. Jesus, I want to hear those words from you. And desiring to hear those words, of course, encourages me to live in such a way that corresponds to the, to the first and the second servant. It is like it spurs me on. It encourages me to live like them. On the other hand, maybe I imagine myself, myself as the last one the one who received the rebuke, you wicked and slothful servant. And maybe I'm reminded, I don't know about you, but personally doing my prayer while, while speaking and reflecting on my own life, I'm reminded of those moments. Not, not so few, many moments in my life when Jesus I have wasted the time that you have given to me. I have, so to speak, hid it in the ground, dug it in the ground. Maybe for all kinds of reasons, maybe it was not for fear, or maybe it was kind of a hidden fear of taking risk, and then maybe as a result of that fear, even kind of looking for compensation, some comfort in a kind of escapistic, um, escapistic use of waste of time. Just, I don't know, all kinds of things that I have done, Lord, wasting time in my life, playing computer games, and I'm saying it's necessarily a bad thing to play computer games, but I know <laughs> I have wasted much time playing computer games a long time ago. And more lately, doing all kinds of other things. <laughs> <laughs> flicking through Instagram or flicking through Facebook late in the evening. Not very late, of course, because I tend to go to bed quite early. But <laughs> nevertheless, too late to be in full energy to do something useful and too undecided to go to bed or to whatever. And uh, thinking, well, I'll just have a quick look. And then the, the two minutes or five minutes that, that I imagine become half an hour. And then, of course, I regret that. And that thought, my Lord, it encourages me to conversion. Because I have another opportunity. I have an occasion of 
coming back, listening to you now, how much better it is to hear that imaginary rebuke in my prayer than to, to hear it really at the end of my life. And I ask for your grace to use my time well. Lord, I'm sorry for all those times that I have wasted your gifts, thinking just about myself, not thinking about you. Therefore, help me more. Give me more that grace of yours to be converted. That's one way of reading this. There are many more different ways of reading it, but I think that's the main thing that I wanted to put for our prayer. But let's come back to the beginning, just for a moment. In the beginning of this meditation, I suggested that the question is not only how I use time, but what's my relationship with time? Even that deeper question. How do I view it? And time, not the only thing, but also my so-called natural talents and also my supernatural talents. All those different opportunities, gifts, possibilities that have been handed to me and therefore, let's hear again the beginning. How Jesus described the sea, and Jesus, how you described it to us. How interesting is this expression of yours that a man going on a journey called his servants and entrusted to them his property. his servants. Well, of course, it is also true that, God, you want to be like a father to me. And that implies you don't want me to be just a servant, like a slave, someone who, like Jesus, you say, someone who doesn't understand what his master is doing, what his master intends. Do you want to be a friend to me? Nevertheless, you don't want me to be a friend that kind of abuses you, abuses that trust and confidence that you show. And in a sense, there is a divine pedagogy there in the whole Bible, how we're not in the very first moment taught to be God's friends and, and children, because we must learn humility first. Servants. Do I see myself as God's servant? Servant, someone who serves God's plans, the kingdom of God. Do I, do I glory in the thought of being able to be God's servant? Or do I find it somehow humiliating, almost thinking that, oh, I am worthy of other things, my own plans, my independence, my autonomy, whatever. But then, autonomy with what? With the property that is not mine? Because Jesus says that that man of the parable, which of course refers to God himself, entrusted his property to his servants. And he asked them to, to use it, trade it, trade with it, according to, to their ability. And when that moment of truth came, when he came back, even the one who had hid the talent, get it back. Here you have what is yours. It's like he came back to the truth. My life was not mine. 
My gifts were not my own. There's that sober realization at the moment of, of death or end of this life that we are not our own creators. But in contrast, why should we find it humiliating? Why should we find it humiliating to be God's servants? What a beautiful thing it is, isn't it? If God is the creator of all, well, he is not only great, he is the greatest of all, and even greater than can, than can be imagined. Infinite in perfection, infinite in goodness, and mercy, and patience, and riches. And Lord, when you give us a share of your property, your riches, when you give us that that entrustment, that, 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 you, that property that you entrust to us, you don't become poor as a result, because you give from your plenty, from your infinite riches. And if I enter into that communication with you, in that cooperation with you, then of course my life is enriched as a result. And it is enriched, and Jesus promises here that that is what exactly happens. Those who receive God's gifts with gratitude and an active attitude of service will be given more. When they give, they give back what was entrusted to them, that master says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Lord, how easy it is for us to be fooled by appearances. You know that money given to them, talent, is a comment here in this Bible, for example, that this talent was more than 15 years' wages of a laborer. So they have different estimates of how much a talent was worth, but it was a lot of money, a very significant amount of money. And so even one talent would be uh, like a, a real treasure. Five talents is like, it's like, it's millions in, in our terms. It's like saying that God is really generous with what he's giving. He's giving us like everything, so many possibilities, gifts. And nevertheless, when the final moment comes and when we, so to speak, pass on to the other side, it will be revealed that that was so little in comparison. You have been faithful over a little. This life was almost just a, like a trial. I don't know about you, but I sometimes think about that world of business and finance and, and there are all kinds of, you know, so-called rich people, of which I am not one. Just recently, someone, a person close to me asked me, when are you going to put all that education of yours to profit? <laughs> like uh, having studied economics and law, and, and now I'm just a poor priest. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and it's such a funny question to me. It's like, well, of course, it's understandable. Especially if you don't believe in God, it kind of makes sense. Like, why are you wasting your time just talking about all those things? You know, but this person didn't, didn't say it in a bad way at all. But it's understandable. 
he, in his thoughts, it would be important to earn money. And then if you earn a good living and maybe even a lot of money, then wow, then your life is amazing and you're rich and maybe you have hundreds of thousands, maybe you have millions, maybe you have... But then, what's the difference? I'm not lacking anything. In fact, this person and many others, well, this person wasn't the rich person, but and many others, and I know some people who are, in human terms, very rich. And there's nothing in their life that I could envy. But really, nothing. And their life is not easy as a result of having a lot of money. <laughs> Quite the contrary. contrary. It's complicated. Very complicated. How easily we are fooled by these appearances. Like in that other parable that Jesus tells about the rich man who became richer and richer and then wondered what to do with all that money. I'll build new barns and put all my treasure there. And then the next, ni next night, the following night, he died. Jesus, you're not asking us to become rich in human terms. You're asking us to be, become rich in divine terms, in your riches, in your property, which is so much more valuable, so different. All these things of matter in this world are just dust and ashes at the end of the day. Let's, let's finish our prayer by turning to the Blessed Virgin Mary and asking her also to, to help, help us put things in the right perspective. Many of us, we are very young still, and there's, we may feel that we have the whole life ahead of us. Well, we never know how much there is left. But that's not the point. If we have a long life ahead of us, let's use it well. And that means living actively well, developing our abilities, developing also our spiritual and supernatural abilities through prayer and through formation, spiritual formation and through sacramental life. But not focusing on ourselves, like my, 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 what can I get now? No, what can I give? What has God entrusted to me so that I would trade with it? Use it for God's glory. Use it for the good of souls, the good of others. Use it to build up God's kingdom. And then we will hear those beautiful words of our Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. We cannot even imagine what that much will be. It will be completely beyond our imagination. And of course, that much includes eternal life. Let's ask now. Blessed Mother Mary to also help us really to put things in the right perspective, in that perspective of God and eternity.